Well, hello and welcome to a special edition of This Week in Pennsylvania. We call it PA Counts. I'm Dennis Owens, and today we'll do a deep dive on the top races in Pennsylvania for the 2024 election. The primary now just over seven weeks away. But before we get started and right off the top, let's take a look at the deadlines that you need to know. Very important to make sure your vote counts. The last day to register to vote is April 8th, and you must be registered to cast a ballot. The deadline to request a mail-in or absentee ballot is April 16th. That's one week before the election. Everybody concedes that's too late. Get it done sooner. And remember, the county election office must have those ballots by April 23rd, that's election day, at 8 p.m. Don't put them in the mailbox the day of the election. They won't count. If you don't use a mail-in ballot, you prefer the old-fashioned and in-person experience, those polls are open April 23rd, as I mentioned, between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Okay, you got all the numbers, the data that you need to know. <laughs> Here to help break down Pennsylvania's biggest races, our analyst Christopher Nicholas of the Eagle Consulting Group and Brittany Crampsey of Brit Crampsey Communications. Thank you both for being here. We should note that Pennsylvania is the largest of the battleground states with its 19 electoral votes. Presidential candidates no doubt see the Keystone State as key to victory. Our station, Emerson College, and The Hill recently released polling on what's expected to be a rematch of the presidential race. It shows former President Donald Trump in Pennsylvania up by two on current President Joe Biden. Margin of error three, undecided 12. Of course, in 2016, it was PA that sealed the White House for Donald Trump. In 2020, Pennsylvania tipped the scales for Biden. These numbers, good news for Trump, but that same poll a month earlier earlier actually had him up seven. So perhaps an erosion of his support in PA. Too early to really lock in on poll numbers. What do you say, analysts? Does it even matter at this point? <laughs> of course it does. It, it matters because it gives us something to refer to later. The good thing about polling is you can see, you know, the ups and the downs. So I, I, I think you need to add that to vote on April 23rd. You need to be registered in a party, Republican or Democrat. Independents can't, can't vote that day. And in terms of that polling for the presidential race, I think we're seeing both uh, potential nominees, supposedly nominees, are both, you know, high floor, low ceiling type of people. Like you're never going to get Trump below 44, but it's really hard to get him above 48. And I would say the same about Biden as well. Any concern? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I think you really hit the nail on the head already by saying the trend is moving in favor of Biden or maybe just in opposition to Donald Trump. And what works against Donald Trump is that he has not done anything since he left office that would inspire people to vote for him. I don't think he's used these four years reflectively. I don't think he's done a whole lot to benefit the country, to you know, burnish his image, make him more palatable to the mass electorate. In fact, I think that he has only whittled away some of his supporters. He has very little room to grow and very little successes or any you know achievements to stand on for the past four years whereas Biden has just been racking up achievements well Biden's been racking up achievements so far and he's got under 43 percent in Pennsylvania <laughs> so I, I would dial that back a little bit the thing to remember is that <laughs> Donald Trump uh, won uh, Pennsylvania in 2016 with 48 percent of the vote in 2020 he got like 48.2 or 3 and he lost so we know what his narrow trading range is and the big difference here between 16 and 20 was a lot of the people who voted for libertarians or didn't vote or whatever more coalesced around Biden, and that's what got him over the top. This year with you Cornel know, West, Trump with Robert F. Kennedy. Well, it remains to be seen if those gentlemen make the ballot in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit too early to know that. But you're right, we could have not two choices. We could have three, four, four or five. five. Jill Stein perhaps as well. Yeah. Does that scare you, a Jill Stein, Cornel West? Because those two, RFK, is, it's up for grabs who exactly that takes votes from, but I think Cornell West, uh, for sure, and Jill Stein take him away from Joe Biden. I think it's interesting, and with the way the Electoral College works, the margins are so slim. So in 2016, Hillary loses Michigan, Pennsylvania, and one or two other states by about 40, 50,000 votes. In each of those states, 40, 50, 60,000 people voted for a third-party candidate. So they didn't want Donald Trump, but their selection of a third-party candidate delivers the entirety of their electoral votes to him. Our poll also assessed what Pennsylvanians view as the most important issue to them. I want you to take a look at this because the economy, immigration, health care, and threats to democracy all out polling abortion, which has dropped down in the pack. Uh, if, Chris, if folks are saying economy is the top issue for them, is that not likely a Trump voter? You know, I think it <laughs> skews more to him 
just like I think the voters who say the 5% or so that said abortion probably skew more towards Biden. That's one of the big things in a campaign that you try to do is you try to focus the conversation, the public conversation, around issues that accrue to your benefit and the opposite for your guy. Remember the famous James Carvel line, you know, uh, it's the economy, stupid, because that's what they wanted to talk about, whereas Bush 41 wanted to talk about, you know, all of the great things he did in foreign policy. So Obviously, in recent elections, abortion has driven Democratic voters out and cost Republicans elections all across the place. Is that, does that poll suggest abortion is fading a bit for the people that see that as the biggest issue? I think abortion maybe ebbs and flows a little bit when it's in and out of the news. I think the ruling in Alabama's Supreme Court, essentially eliminating the, yeah. the process of in vitro fertilization, puts bodily autonomy and reproductive health care uh, back in was, the news. This poll was after that. So if there was gonna be a, a, hit, a, a glitch, you would have seen that. I think things like abortion really helped Democrats last year in an odd year when the turnout's normally low. And if you can get your partisans to come out at three or 4% more than the other sides, that helps you. In a big turnout year like this, it's harder to juice the turnout because it's already relatively so high. I want to show you a recent headline from longtime state political columnist John Baer. Uh, it said, if Biden and Trump love America, they should end their presidential campaigns. And it begins with this lead sentence. The presidential campaigns of Joe Biden and Donald Trump are bad for national politics, worse for America's soul. Trump's campaign is neon lit and cartoon crazy. Biden's borders on sad. Well, John is forever <laughs> a, a terrific wordsmith. Uh, having worked on him with a, with a podcast last year, he does have a sharp eye for that. I have said for a while now that both of these candidates are very codependent on each other. Biden is about the only Democrat that Trump could beat, and Trump's about the only Republican that, that Biden could beat. Well, I think Biden has a 50-year career in service to America, so to suggest that he doesn't love America because he's running to lead it into the next four years, I think, is um, an unfortunate wording there. Uh, cool. John Baer, not known to be an optimist, but I think that <laughs> we can't expect his, his, uh, his wish to come yeah, true. Yeah, but there. I would argue he has his finger pretty much on the pulse of what most people are thinking. They don't want to see a rematch if, either, sure. either way. If the best thing Joe Biden could do to guarantee Donald Trump's defeat would be to say he's not running again, uh, now, I'm not suggesting and vice he versa do for that. Republicans, by I, the way. I'm not suggesting he should do that, but, uh, but that would shake things up because, again, uh, Trump has his issues. He has always <laughs> been a base, uh, a candidate that appeals much more to his base than trying to expand uh, the pool of voters. So uh, that would be very interesting. I doubt that's going to happen at all. But we have a lot of uncertainties this year. All right. What is a certainty? We gotta, we gotta pay some bills. We're gonna come right back. That's a certainty. We're gonna talk about the U.S. Senate race. Stay with us. VA Chamber Minute is paid for by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. Welcome to the PA Chamber Minute. As the state's largest broad-based business advocacy organization, the PA Chamber is constantly working to make it easier to do business in PA. We recently surveyed businesses across Pennsylvania and found that the single most important issue impacting companies today is the workforce. Simply put, too many businesses cannot find qualified workers and the PA Chamber is working to change that. From advocating for policies that will allow businesses to create good paying jobs to supporting investments in career and technical education and also bringing together higher ed institutions with business leaders to align curriculum with industry needs. The PA Chamber is leading the way to strengthen Pennsylvania's workforce. If you're an employer struggling with workforce challenges or you want to get involved in our movement, visit pachamber.org. This is gr great news for Casey. Um, he's nearly at the 50% mark. Um, I don't think that you could ask for much more at the state in the race. Welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania, PA Counts edition. It's more with our analyst, Chris and Brittany. Now, that was the, we did recent polling on the U.S. Senate race, and that was the pollster actually talking about it, saying things really looking up for incumbent Democrat Bob Casey. It shows his lead. Take a look at the poll. Ten points over Republican challenger Dave McCormick. And the pollster said what pollsters always say, that can change on a moment's notice, and it is still real, real early 
to say too much, but Chris, you have run campaigns. You did them for the late Senator Arlen Specter. I still run campaigns. You do, but you <laughs> ran for Arlen Specter, who was a U.S. Senator. Uh, if you were looking at numbers like that eight months out, your reaction would be what? Uh, I'd be worried if I was a three-term Democratic senator and I was that far under 50 percent and the guy I'm running against has basically unlimited funds. I would be concerned about that because as an incumbent, it's always harder for you to change people's minds because you've been there for, in this time, case, three terms. So it's just harder for Casey to move hearts and minds. Now, 48 point whatever that was isn't a long way away from 50 percent, but every point you get closer is a lot harder to get. So it's a lot harder to get from 48.8 to 50 than it is to get from 42 to 43. So I would be heartened if I'm McCormick. A lot of other polls we've seen recently in this race has it closer, but the race hasn't really even started yet. No one's doing any advertising yet in that race anyway. So it's still in the first inning. As ever, I got to disagree with my friend Chris here. If you're up 10 <laughs> points, it's going to be hard to dampen your spirits. 48.8 with a margin of error around three points could be 51% too. He is doing exceptionally well. And we're not unfamiliar with McCormick too. He was rejected by his own party when he ran in the primary in the he last lost cycle. The primary, Brittany, was not rejected. <laughs> I mean, he, he lost didn't, by less than 1,000 uh, votes. Didn't make it to the general. Um, Let's drink some more decaf next time before you come on and say oh, that. I, I'm amped to talk about McCormick here. So he failed to advance in the primary last cycle and he has a primary again this time. So he is going to face negative advertising going through uh, look, April. Bob Casey has no opponent, <laughs> nearly unlimited resources. are both having their, their their signatures uh, challenged, and neither of them has any money or the hopes to raise any money. Bottom so, line, this race is going to tighten up, do you think? I mean, it says 10 points. It's not going to be 10, be, right? This will be the premier race in Pennsylvania this year. I bet Bobby only wins by seven. Even more so than, than, the, than the presidential race. And again, it's not how many points an incumbent is ahead. It's how many points below 50 they are. Pull back the curtain for me. It's important that it stays somewhat close if he wants to get national money, I'm talking about Dave McCormick, right? If they assume or think that he really doesn't have much of a shot, then they, they don't put, they don't uh, throw good money after bad? that. That horse has already left the barn. He's one of the top, Pennsylvania is one of the top three Senate uh, races in the country for, for the GOP because they're, you know, so close to having the, having the majority. So that's, that's not going to change. You know, a couple months from now, you're going to be lamenting the fact that we've seen so many ads uh, for the U.S. Senate. My bosses don't lament that. No, well, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> the Pennsylvania governorship was a top target of the RGA, the Republican Governors Association. No, it wasn't. They didn't give the Republican nominee any money. How because can you say that? their target. position is that they don't fund landslides or long shots, and McCormick is going to be in the very same position. Uh, all right. Okay. Very good. We're talking more in our PA counts. Stay with us. We'll be right back. There's no doubt that I overwhelmingly have more experience and the most appropriate experience to be the Attorney General. Yeah, he is a, an active prosecutor who's as progressive as Larry Krasner in Philadelphia. The city of York is one of the most violent places in Pennsylvania. Welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania PA Council. More with our analyst Chris and Brittany. Pennsylvania will elect a new Attorney General and you just heard from the two Republican candidates. They are York County District Attorney Dave Sunday and Delaware County State Representative Craig Williams. They will debate on this station live on Thursday, March 14th. Mark your calendar. It's live from 7 to 8, and it should be, if it was anything like those comments, <laughs> a pretty feisty affair. Uh, you know, when we first started electing attorneys general in 1980 until 2008, we, Pennsylvania only elected Republicans, and since 2008, only elected Democrats. Why do you think that is, and do you think Pennsylvanians are ready to go back to Republicans? Oh, I don't think we're ready to go back ever. <laughs> but I, I think the Republicans have had the corner on the market of the law and justice message that they're tough on crime. But I think over the past decade or so, since 2008 perhaps, we've seen that these tough on crime policies are not exactly effective. We're seeing very expensive, very high rates of incarceration and not great rehabilitation. I think it may be a little bit of a rejection of that and maybe just whole scale rejection of the Republican platform. Chris, Dave Sunday is the DA. He says he's most qualified. He actually is a, a prosecutor. He has the endorsement of the statewide Republican Party. Williams is a former Marine prosecutor, says he's tougher and more, more law and order. How much weight does that GOP endorsement have? Uh, the GOP endorsement, unlike the Democratic one, carries weight with our primary voters. So Dave Sunday is well, posi well positioned there. Uh, uh, the interesting thing about Craig Williams is he was a Marine fighter pilot and then his plane got 
decommissioned his the type F-18, of plane. F-18, I believe? No, it was an F-4. And okay. so he Very went good. into the law. Uh, Dave Sunday has taken a much more traditional arc of Republican candidates for attorney general being an assistant prosecutor than the DA. Um, so he, he, they have, I think both have good experience, but it's very, very different. It will be a stark contrast to, to Republican primary voters. And I don't know if we're gonna talk about the Democratic primary. We're in just that. a minute, but uh, well, okay. f- let's finish. Uh, Craig Williams running simultaneously for the state house seat and for uh, attorney general. He says he's doing what the party wants because they don't want to lose that seat in such a tight he, uh, house. His, his state house seat, which is part Delaware County, part Chester County, is one of the most competitive in the state and he's held it for a couple times now. So that's true. And there are a couple Democrats who are running simultaneously for their house seat and a statewide yeah, job too. But he's doing what the party wants in that regard, but they, he, he basically uh, put, a, put a finger in their <laughs> eye when, uh, when it came to their, well, that endorsement. Well, the statewide party for yeah. the statewide endorsement and then the local party different. Now let's go to the five Democratic candidates seeking the office of Attorney General. They are former Philly uh, Public Defender Keir Bradford Gray, former Auditor General Eugene D. Pasquale, former Bucks County Solicitor Joe Kahn, Philly State Rep Jared Solomon, Delaware County DA Jack Stolsteimer. We have them live in our studio to debate for an hour. March 12th, circle that on your calendar, 7 to 8, and you can see it right here on ABC 27. And I'm just struck at all the great candidates in a lot of these races, which is a wonderful thing in a democracy. But uh, all of those candidates, four of those candidates, are from the East. Eugene De Pasquale seems to have the rest of the state, and he has one statewide in the past from Auditor General. Does that give him an advantage? I think his name ID remains very high. He was a top vote getter, I believe the first or second time he ran for Auditor General. He ran for Congress here, kept his name ID high. Uh, he's a known entity with a great record in, you know, as a fiscal watchdog and also on progressive policy when he was a member of the House out of York County. But th- this is a tight field. This is an interesting group of candidates with different backgrounds. I'm excited for the debate. I don't really think that we can go wrong, but it is unique to see so many high profile candidates for Attorney General when we didn't see as many for governor. A couple of those Democrats are very far left, kind of Larry Krasner clones. My prediction is that on the Democratic side, this will be the most intense primary we see in the next seven weeks, because a couple of those candidates have raised a lot of money. Plus, Including as, Jared Solomon's as, over a million dollars. Yeah, as Brittany said, you know, uh, Eugene De Pasquale has a lot of name ID from having been statewide auditor general for eight years. So uh, that to me is going to be a really fascinating one to watch. If people aren't paying attention, should they? Because two of the last three governors, Josh Pierre, Tom Corbett became governor. They were attorneys general. So th- does that give it more relevance? That is a clear pipeline in Pennsylvania politics, attorney general moving up to governor. So yes, I don't think that makes a difference in the primary, but in the general, sure. No, but you can say, well, I knew them when they were running for attorney general. <laughs> it's an interesting stepping stone because you can be the face of so many high profile cases, like the way that Shapiro used it, the way that Kane used it, which ultimately didn't work out for her. But I think that they can use yeah, the office. That was bad, yeah. <laughs> they can use the office to build a national profile. Yeah, and the they, state auditor general and the state treasurer do important work, but they don't get on the TV stations battling crime. Well, they're going to get on this show right after this commercial break. We're going to talk about those two races as well. Stay with us. I led you right to one. <laughs> you want to get as much uniformity as possible. Well, that's not what the Constitution says, though. <laughs> but it says they shall be uniform. It doesn't say you want to bring as much uniformity as possible. It yes. says they shall be uniform. So I'm so sorry. How, if, how do you get around that? But there is flexibility, as the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has decided, for example, when it comes to drop boxes. And welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania. More with our analysts, PA Counts edition, by the way, uh, Chris and Brittany. That was State Representative uh, Clint Dowlett and Secretary of State Al Schmidt sparring Both over... Both Republicans, by the way. Spar- exactly. Sparring over mail-in ballots, which continue to be a sore spot uh, for our elections. Some counties have drop boxes, some have multiple, some have one, some have none. Um, Montgomery County recently announced that it's going to uh, see if there's a mistake on the outer envelope and send people to the voter and try to correct it. Uh, clearly, that's only one county. What about the other counties? The point about uniformity is everybody should be doing the same thing. It's, uh, it's how, what, what do we got going on here? It's kind of hard with 67 counties to think that everybody's going to be the same. Republicans are raw on this because in 2020, we got cheated out of a state Senate race that crossed yep. a, across two counties. And one <laughs> county, strong language. Well, it was, it was like 68 votes, Brittany, so it was pretty close. One county filed one set of yeah. rules, another county filed another. So but, for Republicans, that's kind of a sore spot. But, 
It's tough for the state to mandate that county elections offices all do the same thing because they have vastly different resources based on what they're able to raise at the county level. If the state wants to mandate policy, it should come with dollars. Well, there is more. There was it. more dollars thrown at elections, but the bottom line is. Everybody knows this is a problem, and it's not going to get fixed before the, either the primary or the general election this year. Uh, two other statewide race, races to tell you about. Republicans have incumbent Treasurer Stacey Garrity and Auditor General Tim DeFore. They are both seeking re-election. Uh, for Treasurer, there are two Democrats. Erie State Representative Ryan Bizarro, he got the endorsement of the statewide Democratic Party. And Western PA small business owner Aaron McClellan take on that. Bizarro, state rep and endorsement, pretty powerful. I think so, and Representative Bizarro has been in office for some time now. He's the policy chair of the majority now in the House. Uh, with this endorsement, the endorsements that he's racking up from interest groups and county parties, I think he's going to be nearly impossible to beat in this primary and very formidable going into the fall. I am really curious. This is nothing against the guy, but his last name is Bizarro. So I'm really curious <laughs> to see how that works with voters, uh, if not in the primary, then if he wins, then in the general. Um, there are also two Democrats running for Auditor General, and again, a sitting state representative, Philly State Rep Malcolm Kenyatta, who ran for U.S. Senate last time around, and Mark Pinsley, he's a former Lehigh County controller, saying I'm actually a numbers and sense guy, so I'm the guy you should elect. And of course, Tim DeFore, the current Auditor General, is a former auditor from Dauphin County. What do you make of those two? So you mentioned Malcolm Kenyatta had run for Senate. He lost in the primary. But what was great about Malcolm... He was Malcolm rejected by the voters, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he listened to me. I, I, I think that's what happened. <laughs> so Malcolm didn't give up his campaign. He continued to go to every single county as a surrogate for our ultimate nominee. <laughs> he has been out. He's been working. He's been talking to voters. I think he's got a great pulse on what voters want, and I think that he is running a really great so race this he's time. He's obviously bored being a state house member because for the last five years he's been running for statewide office. He also, Mr. Kenyatta, is running for both the state house and this and he has absolutely no experience doing audits and he is very cheery to tell you he doesn't think that matters so if Pennsylvania voters want to elect someone who's never done an audit to be the auditor Malcolm Kenyatta is where you want to go well his answer is we've got a staff full of auditors I don't think you expect your auditor general to be pouring over the, the <laughs> numbers you expect and, and him sense. to know how to judge his auditors and if you've never done an audit you know. We expect you to continue watching us. <laughs> Certainly hope you like this special PA Counts edition and hope to see you right here next week on This Week in Pennsylvania. Thanks so much.